Standing only 5 feet 7 and a half inches tall and weighing 132 pounds, Bruce Lee is considered by many to be the greatest martial artist of the 20th century. A matchless innovator whose enlightened teachings became an inspiration for millions. Bruce Lee is a name which attracts respect and admiration from all over the world. Electric, even in repose. His dynamic on-screen presence and matchless physicality, coupled with an audience appreciation which transcends all cultural boundaries, has resulted in the creation of one of the most enduring and memorable screen icons in the history of motion pictures. Hong Kong, 1972. The most important center of banking and commerce in all of Southeast Asia. The big news today is the premiere of a movie entitled Way of the Dragon. Police struggle to control crowds frantically jostling to catch a glimpse of its young star, 31-year-old Bruce Lee the biggest sensation in the entire history of martial arts cinema. Fame did not come easily for Bruce Lee. Despite his matchless talent and the support of Hollywood luminaries like James Coburn and Steve McQueen, who received lessons from Bruce at $275 an hour, He's unable to break into Hollywood due to the short-sighted and xenophobic attitudes of many U.S. studio executives. Then, after a number of groundbreaking demonstrations on the U.S. exhibition circuit, Bruce is finally discovered by Batman producer William Dozier at the 1964 Long Beach tournament organized by Kempo Karate founder Ed Parker. Mesmerized by Bruce's speed and timing, Dozier recommends him for a role in his forthcoming TV series, the Green Hornet. One day, uh, early in the spring, uh, Bruce came to me and said that he'd had a call from uh, 20th Century Fox that they wanted him to come down and interview for possibly the position of Cato. So uh, he said, what do you think? And I said, well, God, Bruce, I said, you got to go down. And so he went down there and he uh, was accepted for the part. And, and of course, uh, the rest is history. Bruce's success on the Green Hornet would lead to other brief but notable appearances on Marlowe, opposite James Garner, and Longstreet, opposite James Franciscus. Despite the breakthrough, the prejudice continued. And when Bruce is turned down for the lead role in the Kung Fu TV series, a concept which he had created, he's almost without hope. Bruce mentioned that uh, if he hadn't have been Chinese, he would have been doing the Kung Fu series in uh, America. Because he was an actor, a recognized actor here, and he had done some work. The, Studios felt that it wasn't time for a Chinese actor to be a lead in an American television series, that the audience wouldn't accept it. Because after all, they're just out to make bucks, and they got sponsors with products that uh, they felt that uh, they wouldn't identify with enough of the audience by using a Chinese lead character. 
Bitterly disappointed with Hollywood, Bruce visits Hong Kong with his son Brandon in 1970 and to his surprise is enthusiastically greeted by the local media community as the star of the Green Hornet. After a stunning appearance on a local TV show where Bruce performs a demonstration of his art, breaking four consecutively placed boards and one hanging in the air, he's courted by local film and TV producers, keen to acquire the services of this amazing new talent. Now he was on a talk show, I think, when he first came to Hong Kong. And there was a Japanese guy on there that was doing tug of war, and he could sort of put his chi down this way and hold three or four people. And Bruce was on the same talk show, and, uh, the, and they said, well, you're a strong man, Bruce. Why don't you try pull this guy off his mark? And Bruce said, said that's not what I do, but I can knock him out. And uh, the Japanese guy went, whoa, whoa, whoa. and Bruce just knocked him out. <laughs> and then Raymond saw this and called him up, and that's how they got together. After rejecting an offer from the legendary Shaw Brothers studio to sign a seven-year contract on a salary of $2,000 per film, Bruce accepts a part from fledgling producer Raymond Chow to star in his new project, The Big Boss, due to start production in Thailand. <laughs> Now, with a real opportunity to display his art on the big screen, Bruce is a man with a mission. He'd always had an ambition to be an actor and to be successful, and he was very frustrated in, in terms of how far he'd been able to progress his career in Hollywood. And when he came to Hong Kong and helped to redesign and reinvent how martial arts were used in the Chinese cinema, it was with an eye to using the Hong Kong cinema as a stepping stone back to Hollywood and using Hollywood as a stepping stone to becoming an international star. The Big Boss is a massive hit in Hong Kong, outgrossing The Sound of Music and taking more than $3.5 million in its first three weeks of release. Bruce literally becomes a star overnight, captivating audiences with his magnetic charisma, brutal physicality, and a level of martial artistry which is light years ahead of anything ever seen before. After the amazing success of The Big Boss, Bruce is given a larger salary, a bigger budget, and more directorial control for his next project, Fist of Fury, which goes into production in 1971. In what many enthusiasts consider to be the ultimate martial arts movie, Bruce plays the fictional character of Chen Jun, a student of legendary real-life martial artist Fok Yun Gap. In an emotive roller coaster storyline of friendship, betrayal, revenge, and deadly confrontation, Lee is a true force of nature as he battles against Japanese imperialist forces determined to subjugate his people and close down his school. In each of the incredible fight scenes, Lee's execution of technique is exemplary. Whether fighting unarmed or with the weapon that would become synonymous with his image, the deadly nunchaku. Fist of Fury literally takes Asia by storm, and Bruce becomes a megastar in Hong Kong, unable to walk the streets of Kowloon for fear of being mobbed by hordes of adoring fans. Despite Lee's rapid ascension to megastardom, many in the filmmaking community are as impressed with his warmth and congeniality as they are with his drive for perfection. He was a perfectionist when it came to what he did both in terms of martial arts and in front of the camera. He was truly a professional actor as much as he was a professional martial artist. So he was always striving for that excellence in front of the camera. He felt that that went hat in hand with becoming a star. You had to deliver for your audiences. To that end, he was 
uh, I suppose, very demanding on directors and on producers and on screenwriters to give their best to make sure that we were actually getting the best possible product on camera. Um, when it came to dealing with the staff and, and dealing with the crew on the film or dealing with the office staff at Golden Harvest, he couldn't have been nicer. Uh, he was a very genuine, very sincere person and actually would go out of his way to make sure that the workers were taken care of and that, that they did actually have their time to go and have their lunch even though we might be rushing to finish a setup. For his next production, Way of the Dragon, which also heralds his directorial debut, Bruce forms his own production company, Concord, with co-partner Raymond Chow. To give Way a truly international feel, Bruce shoots on location in Rome, using the Italian capital's stunning landmarks to frame the action. In addition, rather than using the Hong Kong fighters so familiar to local audiences, Bruce enlists the services of friend and karate legend Chuck Norris to appear as his nemesis in the deadly climactic confrontation set in Rome's ancient Colosseum. This incredible one-on-one -on -one encounter stands even to this day as one of the most skillful and realistic fight scenes ever committed to celluloid and as a lasting tribute to the outstanding abilities of both men. Way of the Dragon also allows Bruce to take the application of his trademark weapon, the Nunchaku, even further than in Fist of Fury. In an amazing scene at the back of the restaurant, Lee dispatches his attackers using not one, but two sets simultaneously. Predictably, Way of the Dragon smashes the box office record previously set by Fist of Fury, and public demand for the movie is so high that the police have to reroute traffic away from theaters during screenings. Now the biggest star in all of Southeast Asia, Bruce's meteoric rise to fame has single-handedly revitalized the fledgling Hong Kong film industry, previously known only for small-budget Mandarin language pictures with little or no marketability outside the home territory. Until then, it had been pretty much a, uh, an in indigenous thing. Um, it was possible, I would think, in those days, to make a film in Hong Kong and expect to perhaps get your money back just with a Hong Kong audience, although that was marginal. But Bruce Lee did change everything. Uh, you know, <laughs> there was a, there was a whip-cracking vitality about the guy. <laughs> After years of battling cultural prejudice, professional bigotry, and periods of economic hardship in pursuit of his dream, Bruce Lee is finally a star in every sense of the word. And in Hong Kong, his photograph dominates almost every magazine and newspaper in circulation. One time, sitting in his office, he told me his dream was one day was to be a bigger movie star than Steve McQueen, who at the time was the biggest movie star in the world. Uh, it's a little ironic that 20 years later, more people probably remember Bruce Lee than remember Steve McQueen. However, I can assure you, if you walk down the street with Bruce Lee or you tried to go into a restaurant in Hong Kong, you immediately became aware of how big a star he was. And there was no star bigger than Bruce Lee in Asia. And I would probably say, even to this day, there is no star Certainly there is no Asian film star that has ever achieved the level of recognition and uh, popular appeal that Bruce Lee had and continues to have to this day. Fame, however, did not come without a price. Because of his status of being very famous, I mean, I, I've never been with him in a place where there was like 20 to 30, possibly 50 people just crowding around him. So he didn't have any privacy and he, he didn't like that part, but he enjoyed 
having what I call uh, fame, but he didn't like sometimes the things that went along with it, like eating at a restaurant and people, you know, looking in the window to see who, well, who he was and people bought him. And then he said also that he'd, people are always asking him favors and he didn't know who his real friends were. So I, I think that bothered him a lot, you know. And I asked him, well, have you been working out? I said, well, I don't have the time to work out before because there's no one, I just can only can train my own body. I, I can't work out with anybody. And film work, uh, it's not exactly a, a workout, you know, it's, it's just doing what the, the film requires. So uh, I think with his newfound status as a, as a movie star, uh, he had some, definitely some dislikes about it because it, it uh, invaded his privacy. In August of 1972, Bruce begins work on a project which will communicate for the first time the true essence of the revolutionary martial arts ideology, which he's developed over a lifetime of dedicated study, philosophical reflection, and impartial evaluation. His ideology is known simply as Jeet Kune Do, or the way of the intercepting fist, and the project which he has chosen to illustrate it is entitled The Game of Death. Kundo was man's liberation from system and style. He's truly expressing what works for him. Because what works for one indi indi individual, it may not work for another individual. And that's the bottom line. In the words of Bruce Lee, Jeet Kune Do is a direct expression of one's feelings with a minimum of movement and energy. Bruce's favorite analogy in the explanation of this philosophy is, in building a statue, the sculptor does not add clay to his subject, rather he chisels away the surplus material until the truth is revealed without obstructions. Thus, JKD is not a daily increase, it's a daily decrease. In practical terms, Jeet Kune Do is a fluid fighting system without limitations. Jeet Kune Do, uh, according to Bruce Lee, meant the way of the intercepting fist. I guess like if a punch or a kick is coming your direction, you're the man's energy is coming towards you. You want to try to intercept the person's force and use the opening, such as if a person is firing a punch at you, he's leaving his chin open, he's leaving his ribs open. If he's firing a kick, he's leaving his midsection open, he's leaving his groin open. He's immobile, he can't move if he's standing on one foot executing the kick. And then you can take advantage of the person's weak points at that, at that particular time. Lee considers the message within the game of death as his greatest truth and he resolves that this cinematic legacy will forever illustrate his key ideological and martial theories for future generations to come. In essence, it will be an artistic exploration of the fundamental principles of Jeet Kune Do. What he was trying to tell me always is this is, I'm not trying to take a little bit from Choi Le Fan and a little bit from Prey Mantis and a little bit from Wing Chun and then put a little Western boxing. He says, I want to express myself. So what I want to get from this method is the essence. What is the essence of Wing Chun? What is the essence of uh, uh, Chin Ah? What is the essence of uh, Western boxing? What is the essence of Choi Le Fat? I'm not copying the techniques, but the, the essence, why it's good. And he always talked about the essence with me. And uh, I feel that's basically what he was, what he was trying to do. So in the Jun Fan Gung Fu, this is how Ji Kune Do was evolved. He says, I want to use, utilize all ways, not just stay within the Chinese method. However, I'm Chinese, and I'll, it has a Chinese name, but Ji Kune Do as a whole was to absorb what literally what is useful, reject what is useful, and add specifically what was what's your own. On his objectives as a filmmaker, Bruce had stated during filming for an earlier role, I hope to make multi-level films here, the kind of movies where you can just watch the surface story if you like, or look deeper into it. Most of the Chinese movies to date have been very superficial and one-dimensional. 
when I was uh, training with, uh, with Bruce Lee, and he wanted to make pictures, and at the time uh, I was with him, I, I didn't fully understand, but he says, you know, I'm gonna make movie pictures, and from these movie pictures, people are gonna appreciate martial art, and when they start to appreciate martial art, they're gonna appreciate the Chinese culture, because marsh, Chinese martial arts, they get to appreciate something in Chinese. If they can appreciate something that the Chinese have, then they will be able to appreciate what other Asians have. If they appreciate what other Asians have, then they're going to appreciate things from other cultures, whether it be from the Asian or from the Latin American countries, or if it's from the European countries, or if it's from the African countries, they're going to appreciate it. So it's, I guess it's, it serves as a universal vehicle for all of us to, to understand each other. Whilst location scouting with James Coburn in Nepal for a project entitled The Silent Flute in 1968, Bruce had fallen in love with the intricate multi-level pagodas on display there and resolved to use them in a future project. When he begins development for the game of death four years later, Lee resurrects the idea once again, finally settling on the beautiful and dramatic Buddhist temple of Pok Ju So as the backdrop for the climactic fight scenes. <laughs> From inception to realization, Bruce is involved in every aspect of production for the game of death, taking on the responsibility of producer, director, scriptwriter, action choreographer, and of course, leading actor. Filming in the height of the oppressive Hong Kong summer in stifling sound stages with no air conditioning, temperatures often reach the mid-90s during principal photography, with humidity levels running at an average of 90%. For his co-stars, Lee's drive for perfection can be both exhausting and at times frustrating as take after take is required to capture the perfect shot. Lee, however, is hardest on himself. This rare sequence of outtakes shows him carry out no less than 10 takes for a nunchaku display sequence which will remain on screen for just under four seconds. Bruce suspends filming on the game of death in October of 1972 when he learns from producer Fred Weintraub that Warner Brothers are interested in co-producing his next film. This historic pronouncement heralds for the first time in the history of motion pictures a co-production between a Chinese and an American studio. The opportunity is timely. The film is Enter the Dragon. Working feverishly on the project from January to April 1973, Lee, in characteristic fashion, supervises every aspect of the production on Enter the Dragon. His handling of the fight choreography in particular is outstanding, raw full-blooded and bursting with energy. Each sequence carries the trademark stamp of Bruce Lee quality. Upon viewing the completed rushes for the project in mid-April of 1973, Bruce tells his wife Linda that he's delighted with his work. Perhaps he dares to believe for the first time that international stardom finally beckons. Now, with Enter the Dragon waiting in the wings and producers from around the world flooding his production office with offers, Bruce turns his attention back to the game of death. It is the second week of July, and as it turns out, the last week of his life. Originally, having been conceived as a multi-level project of passion for the local Hong Kong audience, it's highly probable that Bruce would have begun to reevaluate the whole Game of Death project in the light of his newfound circumstances. Feeling more confident than ever about his future, he begins to talk to ex-Bond star George Lazenby about a major role, as he undoubtedly feels it will give the film a greater level of commerciality. Although Lee's initial outline is sketchy, Lazenby is excited about the potential of the project. 
the main thing was he wasn't going to kill me. He said, I'm not going to kill you. You're going to be a good guy, because he killed practically everybody in these movies. They, they turned out to be bad. But he thought that uh, I'd be a great communication rod way to the people that he didn't get through to because of his Chinese-ness. And he said, some people don't see that we're all the same. Well, I was going to be Bruce's uh, man that came in and saved him at the end and got him out of this it was some kind of a house, pyramid thing with the top floor. And I came in there, and that was going to be my introduction. And I was like a, a, a mentor. And he was like super physical, but I was wiser. And it was that kind of thing. And I'd been mixed up in Chinese philosophy for... I'd been caught up in some war or something and fallen back into their philosophy for years in Korea or somewhere like that, I think, or some a monastery. I forget the uh, exact details, but he was going to introduce me that way, and then I was going to fade out again and then come into another movie with him later. Now at last, Lee is on the verge of realizing his most enduring and heartfelt ambition, to communicate the beauty of his Chinese culture and the powerful dynamic of his unique martial arts philosophy to a truly worldwide audience through the medium of film. It is then, with a cruel sense of irony, that fate strikes its most tragic blow. Bruce Lee's death hits Hong Kong like a tornado. Stunned residents react in shock and disbelief. The local press is full of speculation and rumor. How could one so fit and healthy die so young? Thousands turn out for Lee's funeral, and the authorities have to lay on hundreds of extra police officers around the Kowloon funeral parlor to keep the crowds at bay. Above an ornate portrait of Bruce hangs a banner which reads, A star sinks in a sea of art. All around are draped thousands of tributes, as close friends and colleagues come to pay their last respects. Members of the funeral party file past the coffin. Many are overcome with grief. Linda and the children gather around for a final look before leaving for the airport. Bruce's body will travel with them to Seattle on this, his final journey. In Hong Kong, public controversy continues to rage over the circumstances of Lee's death. On Friday, July 20th, 1973, the day of his passing, Bruce had arranged a restaurant appointment with George Lazenby, partner Raymond Chow, and Taiwanese actress Betty Ting Pei at Hong Kong's Hyatt Hotel to further discuss script ideas for the game of death. He never arrived. The day he died, we had lunch together, and we were discussing the film more and more deeply, and we are having lunch, and we always had a little corner of a restaurant with a screen because people would bug you. If Bruce was there, they'd just sit literally swarm and stand there and watch him while he ate. And so we had a screen and we're sitting in the back of this restaurant. He said, I got a headache. I said, and I thought, Jesus, you know, I often get a headache, but it's usually from drinking. And he said, I don't have a headache very often. But um, I said, well, look, skip tonight. We're going to have dinner that night. And I said, skip tonight. And when I get back and my wife's going to have a baby and when I, that's done, my wife was eight and a half months pregnant. I said, I'll be right back and we'll get on with this movie. I said, but don't worry about tonight if you don't feel well. He said, if I said I'm going to be there, I'll be there. And I was waiting with Raymond Chow that evening for Bruce. And it was, he was about half an hour late, and it's not like him to be late. So I called. I said to Raymond, I said, where's Bruce? Do you know where he is? He said, oh, yeah, he's, uh, I know where he is. This is the number. Calling en route to collect Ting Pei from her apartment, Bruce had complained of a severe headache. Ting Pei had offered him a pain-killing tablet called Equagesic. After taking the pill, Bruce had lain down on the bed to rest, but quickly lost consciousness. He never recovered. Bruce Lee is pronounced dead on arrival at Hong Kong's Queen Elizabeth Hospital. He was only 32 years old. In the absence of a statement from the Lee family, the local press continued to fuel speculation, and then at Kai Tak Airport, just before boarding the plane which will carry Bruce and the family back to the United States, Linda Lee finally breaks her silence. 
It is my wish that the newspapers and the people of Hong Kong will stop speculating on the circumstances surrounding my husband's death. Although we do not have the final autopsy report, I hold no suspicion of anything other than natural death. I myself do not hold any person or people responsible for his death. Fate has ways we cannot change. The only thing of importance is that Bruce is gone and will not return. He lives on in our memories and through his films. Please remember him for his genius, his art, and the magic he brought to every one of us. For we who knew him very well, his words and thoughts will remain with us forever and influence the rest of our lives. The coroner agrees. His verdict, death by misadventure. Bruce was deemed to have been hypersensitive to an ingredient in equagesic called meprobabate. This hypersensitivity caused a brain swelling known in medical parlance as cerebral oedema, which in turn led to his death. Through injuries and what have you, I got to know the doctor who did the autopsy, and they said it was just like a blood vessel burst inside his head and started leaking, like, a, like an inner tube and a tire got too thin and just started leaking, and that was causing a headache. I think it was just overtrained. A lot of people say he got hit there or whatever, but or secret this or secret that, but I just think he was, he was too dedicated to his training. It was sad. In the years following Bruce Lee's death, the game of death rushes, on which he'd worked so passionately during the last months of his life, remained unedited and placed in semi-permanent storage in the vaults of Golden Harvest Studios. By 1978, the fervor surrounding the unused footage had reached fever pitch. Fans from all over the world want to see their hero in action one last time. In response to the overwhelming public demand, Golden Harvest Chief Executive Raymond Chow hires a team of researchers to work on a new Game of Death script, while scouring Europe and the United States in the hope of finding a writer who can capture the essence of Bruce Lee's philosophy and writing style. Eventually settling with Jan Spears, Chow also enlists the services of Enter the Dragon director Robert Klaus to oversee the production. For action legend Sammo Hung is left the most difficult task of all, to recreate no less than seven fight scenes in the unmistakable style of the late great Bruce Lee. Of course, that time is everybody's very sad, you know, about the Bruce pathway, you know, and then the, the Raymond Chow, you know, he asked me to do it, you know, finish the the the, the game of that the movie. Of of course, I love to do, you know, I really love to do because he is my hero in my heart already, you know. Of course, I every detail, everything, you know. I know that I see the rushes, I see his films, you know, and his close up. How do I use his close-up? I'm working 15 days, day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night, just like that. You know, when my sleeping time, just on the on the way in the car. You know, sleeping to another location to that location. Third, we land. Oh, we arrive. Then we shooting. You know, something like that. You know, in the middle, I want to go back to to the studio editing. You know, 15 days, my eyes look. They have a, they're like oh ping pong ball there, you know, two ping pong. Same why you put a ping pong ball in your eyes, you know. Yeah, that's true story. From hundreds of hopeful candidates, Samo chooses a number of doubles, including Tai Jun Kim and Tong Lung, and enlists the services of acrobatic genius Yun Bu to recreate the combative essence of Bruce Lee. This groundbreaking motion picture, which is scored for the international market by Bond legend John Barry heralds the use of Panaglide cameras for the first time in a Hong Kong production, and also breaks the record for the number of extras used during principal photography. Featuring a basic linear storyline concept, this modernized version tells the story of a talented martial arts actor fighting for his freedom against members of a powerful crime syndicate. It is released to a fanfare of public appreciation in 1979, breaking box office records across the globe and even stripping the box office receipts for Enter the Dragon in Japan.
Containing only 11 minutes of footage from the original rushes shot by Bruce Lee in 1972, this 1978 version, although commercially successful, totally abandons the ideological overtones of Bruce Lee's original multi-level concept. The other 49 minutes of footage, which Lee had shot back in 72, is believed lost to the ravages of time, and so reluctantly, fans around the world reconcile themselves to the fact that they will never see the expanded storyline from the game of death, as Lee intended. But then, 21 years later, the impossible happens. In 1999, during a search of the Golden Harvest archives, British writer Bay Logan discovers the original unedited rushes for the game of death hidden in storage. Totaling almost 60 minutes, this raw footage reveals the genesis of a very different kind of movie. It is common knowledge within the Hong Kong filmmaking community that Bruce was far from crystallizing his entire concept for the game of death. However, an analysis of the completed rushes, coupled with a literal translation of Lee's unfinished script notes, uncovers the following basic premise. Three warriors are given the task of fighting their way up a multi-level pagoda to pass from one floor to the next. Each fighter must defeat a master of a particular style. During the progression of the battle, two of the fighters will be defeated and killed due to their inability to adapt to the differing challenges presented on each floor. The ultimate warrior, played by Lee, a fluid fighter unrestricted by an adherence to any one particular style, would on the other hand, successfully defeat each subsequent master before gaining enlightenment after victory on the uppermost level of the pagoda. For his accomplices in the movie, Lee wanted one, although an ally, to appear slightly devious towards his character, thus creating a counterpoint in the dynamic of the movie plot. For the antagonistic accomplice, Lee chooses James Tien, a regular Golden Harvest studio player, who had starred opposite Lee in two of his three previous films in Hong Kong. For the second accomplice, a simple-minded but technically excellent martial artist, Lee elects Hong Kong stuntman, Che Yun. Although both veterans of the industry, it would be the first time the two men had worked together. As for the guardians, or protectors of each of the five floors, Lee makes his selection from some of the most accomplished martial artists in the world. The first level was to be guarded by Wang Yu Sik, a real-life master of Taekwondo and Hapkido. Lee had worked with Wong before in Way of the Dragon and was very impressed with both his execution and timing. <laughs> Tragically, due to Lee's untimely demise, the two men would never work together on the game of death. This rare screen test footage shot by Lee in Hong Kong's new territories is all that remains of Wong's involvement in the project. For the keeper of the second floor, Lee chooses his real-life friend and senior student, Taki Kimura. I, I have to believe that the, the reason that he asked me to be in that picture was not because I had any ability, but I think he felt that he uh, uh, owed me something possibly, and uh, maybe that was his way of trying to pay me back, because uh, when he called me and asked me to be in this game of death, uh, uh, I told him very, very up, very, uh, you know, simply, I said, look at Bruce, I said, uh, um, I've got two left front feet and, uh, and I can't move like you want me to and uh, we have a very strong friendship but I don't want you to uh, kick my butt and we end up, uh, you know, not friends. So I said, just let me sit here and, and just uh, enjoy all the popularity and the success that you're making. But uh, he said, no, he said, I want you in that picture. And he said, I've already had uh, Danny Nasanto and Jabara in there. And he said, I want you in there to be the praying mantis uh, uh, practitioner that I have to go through in this in this uh, uh, tower or some kind of a, of a uh, uh, house or something that they were trying to get up to in the top floor and uh, I, I guess he put me in a spot where I was maybe more afraid to say no than anything else and so I finally reluctantly agreed to do so. For the guardian of the third floor, the Temple of the Tiger, Lee selects another of his real-life students, Dan Inosanto. Not only is Inosanto the most accomplished student of Lee's fighting system, Jeet Kune Do, but also a master of Kempo Karate and Filipino Eskrima. Inosanto's incredible skill with the deadly Nunchaku, a weapon once used by peasants as a rice flail, allows Lee to film the first ever full-on Nunchaku battle between two opponents. 
thereby creating another first in the history of action cinema. I was supposed to uh, play uh, a Filipino uh, from the southern Philippines the way he wanted it. And uh, that's what he portrayed me as. You know? And uh, he, he was constantly changing the script. And, but there were so many levels. I, I think the bottom part was supposed to be guarded by, the, by karate people. The second part was to be guarded by another group. It was a Chinese group. I forgot what the style was. I think it was going to be Praying Mantis. And, and then they had an, one more group. And then I don't know if I was on the fourth floor or the third floor because he was constantly changing it. And then the last floor was the style of the unknown, which was played by uh, Kareem. <laughs> I liked it because it was it was new for me, and I I wasn't into film work, and I, I'd never worked in uh, uh, that atmosphere before, so I, I I enjoyed it very very much. To stick fighting and nunchaku combat, Lee would also add grappling and joint locking. Consequently, for the guardian of the fourth floor, the Temple of Gold, Bruce settles on Chi Hon Jae who at the time of filming was a seventh degree black belt in the dynamic Korean art of Hapkido. For the uppermost level of the pagoda, the floor of the unknown, Bruce decides to showcase yet another of his students, LA Lakers basketball sensation, Abdul Karim Jabbar. Unlike the previous masters, Karim fights with an unknown style, symbolizing the highest level of the martial arts. As with the fluid approach demonstrated by Lee's character, this unknown style is a cinematic representation of the ideological essence of Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do came about as a sincere effort to, to abolish system and style. What he was trying to say is, is it, it, it didn't matter what art you took as long as you can express yourself. I've always believed that, that it really a person, if he's really good and really talented and he's very athletic, it doesn't matter if it's a, a Japanese system or a Korean system or an Okinawan system or a Chinese system. You're truly expressing yourself. So you, you don't really fight like the system that you've been brought up. You are expressing yourself, although the system will help in your training. The fact that Lee's character in the game of death would be battling advocates of different styles is hugely significant. He's asking the audience to consider not only the merits of each particular style, but in a broader and more fundamental sense, to evaluate the validity of style itself. Now with key members of his cast in place, Lee is able to compose three groundbreaking fight sequences, which are both fluid, dynamic, and rich in symbolic subtext. As a cinematic representation of his art, it is undoubtedly his finest work. According to Bruce Lee's teachings, when evaluating new experiences, you should look inside and listen to your own true feelings. Your own truths may change with each new experience, but if you never reappraise your values, you could be refusing to acknowledge the benefits that can stimulate change, growth, and improvement. Fundamentally, Lee states, your truth is not my truth, and my truth is not your truth. It's our responsibility to create and leave that impression upon those around us so that they can be better involved and better people themselves because of what Bruce taught us. In the light of the international acclaim which would have come to Bruce Lee after the astounding commercial success of Enter the Dragon, it is not possible to fully understand in which direction he would have taken the partially completed game of death rushes. Bruce clearly stated his desire to return to the project in his diary on the day of July 20th, 1973. What started out as a labor of love may have come under external commercial pressures. We will never know for sure. What is clear is Bruce's intention to educate as well as entertain. Of one thing we can be certain, the finished motion picture would have glistened with the electric vitality and dynamic physical precision for which his work is famous all over the world.